Hey everybody and welcome back. You know, every time I start these videos, I really want to do New York Stilo impersonation. You know how he starts all his videos? Hello to all YouTubers! So there it is, I finally did it. I wish he'd uh, post a new video because so many of us just loved watching his videos. Anyway, welcome video nine in my series, how to set up your first marine aquarium. This, the last of two videos, is gonna be about adding livestock. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Go ahead and like, subscribe, add comments, positive or negative, totally fine. Uh, yeah, all right, so we're gonna jump right in. Um, quarantine tanks is the first thing we're gonna talk about. Okay, here's an image of a quarantine tank. Let's talk about quarantine tank, tanks and medical tanks. Now, to be honest, I do not have a quarantine tank and shame on me. Um, I should, I absolutely should, I know I should. Every time I have some extra money though, I don't wanna spend it on a quarantine tank and that's just ridiculous, I should have one. So don't follow my advice, don't be like the 95% of reefers like myself who do not have a quarantine tank because we are courting disaster, all right? A quarantine tank is a small tank, 10 gallon, 20 gallons, that you put your livestock in and you watch them for a period of time, a month, two months, to make sure they're healthy, to make sure they don't have anything bad on them. And if you do see something bad, then you can treat them. Because once you add the livestock to your display tank, it's all over. If they have um, nasty critters that you don't want, you might never be able to get rid of it from your tank, all right? So you set up something called a quarantine tank. So basically it will eliminate pests, hopefully, and disease from your tank. And then it's supposed to be less stressful on your fish. You know, it will give them a place where they can hang out, you know? Um, so like in, in the picture you're seeing here, this is a great quarantine tank. There, There's no predators in there. There's no other fish bothering them. They got a couple pieces of PVC piping that they can hide in. They can kind of hide from you, right? Awesome. So how to do a quarantine tank? Um, 10 gallon, 20 gallons, probably even a little bit better. Throw in some PVC pipes, make sure they're rinsed. Um, mix up salt water, right? You can take salt water from your tank to put in there or you can just mix up some fresh salt water. Um, doesn't really matter here. And then all you wanna put in there is a heater, like a power head to keep circulation going. Um, if, you, if you're if you putting corals in there, you can put lights, but you don't even necessarily need to put lights in if you're just putting fish. Um, and then put a little hang on the back filter, which you can see in this, they've done. So really simple there. And then a bare bottom. Don't put gravel, don't put sand. Just keep it super duper uber simple. Um, some of you might be wondering, oh my gosh, but how am I gonna be filtering stuff? Well, you're gonna be doing water changes, a lot of water changes, right? So you're gonna have a low bio load and you are going to be controlling your, um, you know, uh, your ammonia and your nitrates through water changes. You can also, you know, throw a sponge, for example, into your primary tank, throw it in there for a couple months, let it colonize with beneficial bacteria and then throw it in your hang on the back. And that way you'll already have some, some bacteria there to help convert the ammonia into nitrites and start the nitrogen cycle. Um, what not to do in a quarantine tank? Don't put live rock in there. Um, you don't need a skimmer, no sand bed. In a quarantine tank, um, don't, don't use copper, all right? It'll kill inverts. Um, and no bright lights, all right? Those are, those are just general no-nos, all right? Um, just kind of stick away from that kind of stuff. Now, what's the difference between a quarantine tank and a medical slash treatment tank? They can be the same tank, but if you're using a tank to treat a fish, after you treat that fish or that livestock, you need to drain it and sterilize it, right? Because even a tiny drop of water can keep some bad pest organism alive, right? So for example, in, the, in this picture here, if you were treating this fish with copper, let's say, right? Um, when you're done with it, you need to remove all the water, you need to remove the sponges and sterilize everything because if you were to use the same water and you were to throw in some, some invertebrates, some crabs, some shrimp, you would kill them because invertebrates can't, um, can't, they don't like copper, right? Basically, they, they will die. Um, so your medical tank's gonna be used for sick fish, sick inverts, mainly sick fish, right? You can treat them with copper, you can treat them with other meds. Um, yeah, and you don't wanna use anything like that, like that live rock or sand, because it can absorb that copper and, and hold on to it, okay? So if you are using it as a medical treatment tank, 
you know, once your fish is treated and they're transferred back to your main tank, drain it all and, you know, fill it back up, kind of start over again. I know it's a pain, but it's really, really important. The last thing about adding livestock um, is washing your hands. I know this sounds probably really simple, uh, but you don't, I mean, minimize putting your hands in the tank, right? Um, and washing your hands with soap and then putting it in the tank is not the best idea. Those soaps are really not good for your tank. The best way you're gonna wash your hands is just use lots and lots of hot water, scalding water, as hot as you can possibly take it, and just rinse them off as much as you can. Better yet, get one of those little, you know, grab, grab and hold thingies that you use to pick up trash, sterilize that, and then use that in your tank. But yeah, just wash your hands with lots of hot water. Okay, choosing livestock, it's a really big decision, um, and a lot of reefers just kind of haphazardly do it. That's fine, but it's not ideal. You know, I keep stressing backwards planning, decide what you want at the beginning, and then build your tank around that, right? So let's talk a little bit about choosing livestock. What you can see here is a compatibility chart. These aren't perfect by any means, right? But they give you a general idea of, of what animals you can keep with what animals, right? Um, so you can just type that in. They're kind of all over online. Um, things to consider when you're choosing your livestock, the size of the tank, you know, and are you buying um, a baby that's gonna get too big for your tank? The space requirements, do they need a lot of space to be peaceful? You know, uh, are they aggressive? Are they peaceful? What kind of food do they need? You know, some of the prettiest ones are mandarins, but you know what, unless you have a really good supply of copepods, they're gonna die. So, you know, if you probably don't have a refugium, they probably don't wanna get that one. Um, yeah, and do they require a sand bed? You know, if you're gonna get a pistol shrimp that's gonna burrow, how deep of a sand bed do you need? Are you gonna be getting a, a sifting starfish? Well, maybe you have a deep sand bed, you know, and you don't want them to eat all that beneficial stuff in your deep sand bed. So just consider all that stuff. Okay, so for fish, check the compatibility chart, talk with your LFS, um, check forums, right? I've gotten good advice from my LFS and I've gotten just terrible advice from my LFS. So, um, just just do your research, okay? Is your fish a jumper? You know, rest in peace, Dora, my orange spotted goby. I had a top on, but if they're a jumper, if there's a threat of jumping, have a top right away because they will jump and they will die. How big will it get? You know, if you're gonna be buying a baby now, is it gonna to grow too big for your tank? You know, just consider that. Um, is it gonna eat my corals, my fish, or my invertebrates? You know, like I really wanna get um, a Hawaiian toby, you know, a puffer fish but they just evidently love chomping on LPS corals, so I'm not gonna get that. Um, do they hang out in the top, middle, or bottom of a tank? You know, if you have some fish that hang out in the top, you know, uh, maybe think of getting some that hang out on the bottom. Uh, um, should it be introduced in pairs? Like, um, for example, clownfish, you know, they're oftentimes better uh, and less aggressive if you introduce two at the same time, so consider buying a pair instead. Uh, and then there's just so many more considerations. Regarding introducing inverts, like shrimps, clams, crabs, um, cleanup crews, all that kind of stuff. The most common inverts you add first are cleanup crews, and I'll talk about them uh, here in a little bit. Uh, but about snails, there's so many different types of snails, and they differ in what they eat, um, where they live, temperature requirements, uh, some snails will eat different kinds of algae, some will burrow in the sand, some will knock over your rocks if they're not secured. So just consider that. Some of them you're going to be constantly putting your hand in the tank to flip them back over. You know, so uh, be considerate of that. Hermits, right? Hermit crabs are going to outgrow their shells, you know. So if you buy hermits and they don't have larger shells available, they're probably going to attack your snails and eat them and then take theirs. So make sure you place extra shells in there. Um, crabs. A lot of crabs, you know, will eat some um, some bad algae, which is great, but they might also start nipping at your corals. So just be careful with what kind of crabs you're getting. Shrimp, some burrow, some don't burrow. <coughs> Need to consider that. Um, how about when you're buying an anemone? Basically, you're looking for uh, anemones that are gonna move around, you know, maybe buy them first. You know, check for good color, make sure their mouth is closed, um, that their foot isn't ripped, basically. And then corals, consider, you know, there's LPS, there's SPS. 
um, soft corals, that kind of stuff. Um, what what are their lighting requirements? You know, are they high light, low light? Um, do they need super glue and epoxy? You know, you're gonna have to purchase that in order to secure them. And what kind of coral dip are you gonna need to clean them? All right, um, and then let's talk about cleanup crews real quick. <clears throat> I recommend starting small for a cleanup crew. And there are so many out there, and my LFS really did convince me on going with snails. Um, and I'm, I'm relatively happy. I wish I did have some hermits in there, but um, I, I just don't want them to kill each other. But you do what you need to do. Start small. I started in my reefer with um, 10 trochus and 5 serith. And since then, I have added uh, 10 more seraths, and that seems to be the right amount for me. And chose the appropriate crew. You know, um, different, the seraths burrow in the sand, the trochus graze on the glass um, and on the rocks. Um, you know, but there's also some other cool stuff out there than snails. You know, hermit crabs will eat lots of bad algaes. Um, starfish are awesome. Just make sure they don't grow too big for your tank. Brittle stars are great for underneath your rocks, you know. Uh, they're not true starfish, but they'll eat a lot of detritus and organic matter. Sea urchins can be cool, but make sure that you have your rock work in place because they can definitely knock it over. Um, and then there's sand sifting fish um, like gobies. You know, is your tank big enough to be able to feed them? All right, when we come back, I'm going to talk about acclimation. All right, acclimating. There's tons of videos on them, so you can just check them out. I uh, just want to talk about it a little bit. Um, if you have a quarantine tank, uh, always quarantine first, okay? Um, now, but how are you going to introduce them to the quarantine tank? So you go to the fish store, you pick up your fish, you pick up your inverts, right? They come in plastic bags. What do you do? Um, a lot of people float their bags, and that's fine. Um, they literally take their bags, they float them in the tank for 15 minutes, and what that does is that equalizes the temperature. That's, that, that's all equalizes. Um, the problem I have with that is you don't know what's on that plastic bag and I don't want to add anything um, into the water and by floating your plastic bag you're adding what's ever on the outside of the bag into your tank so I don't do that all I do is I get a five gallon jug you know I tilt it on its side and I empty the contents of the bag whatever livestock into that tank right then I get a piece of airline tubing tie a couple knots in it attach it up to my tank, and then I slowly drip, maybe a drop a second. And I, I drip acclimate for 30 minutes to an hour, right? Um, it's gonna slowly equalize the temperature, um, it's gonna equalize the pH, alkalinity, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, my LFS rec doesn't even recommend doing that, I don't know why, you should always drip acclimate. Don't drip acclimate too long, obviously, because your temperature is not gonna be raised, it's gonna always be a little bit lower. Um, yeah, uh, you never ever want to add your local fish store water to your tank, ever. Um, a lot of times they treat them with copper, you don't want that in your tank, um, and who knows what's in that water. So, you know, after you drip acclimate them, you know, for 30 minutes or so, then just get a net. You know, um, now like puffer fish, don't use a net, but anyway, in general, get a net, pick them out of there, you know, get as much of the water out, and then introduce them into your tank. Um, for fish, you can use a freshwater dip. Um, watch videos online. You don't really pre-treat them. Um, you know, if you're not quarantining them, if you're not giving them a copper treatment, a lot of your LFSs will use copper, so it's not a big deal anyways. Um, but you can freshwater dip them. There's pros and cons to that. Basically, that means that a lot of the um, pests that may be riding along your fish can't uh, handle fresh water but your fish are going to be able to it's definitely going to stress them out but um check videos online for that <clears throat> regarding an anemone you're going to drip acclimate them just the normal way um you quarantining them is always a good idea definitely do not fresh water dip an anemone um, and just know that whenever you put your anemone in your tank right place it in there um put it where you want it hold it there for a few seconds let its foot grab hold it's going to move wherever the heck it wants to move and that's just how it's gonna be. Regarding corals, again, same thing, quarantine, drip acclimate. Um, I use a um, product called Coral RX, um, and I definitely recommend any corals you have um, treating them first. So basically is uh, what I do when I get a coral is I, I drip acclimate them for 30 minutes, right? Then I get some uh, a, a small little bucket with some tank water. I mix in the correct amount of coral dip, 
and then I place my coral in there. And um, I don't have a power head, so I just use a turkey baster, and I put gentle uh, amounts of water movement on the coral, and you're gonna be amazed by all the, all the pests that fall off your coral. So you wanna do that for a few minutes, you know, then probably your coral comes on a plug, trim the plug, remove it from the plug, um, and then you're gonna use super glue and epoxy. And the best way to do it, I found, <coughs> take your coral, turn it upside down, put some super glue gel on the coral, put your epoxy on top of the super glue gel, and then put some super glue uh, gel on top of the epoxy, and then put it into the tank where you want it and hold it in place. Uh, that does seem to work pretty well. Um, lastly, feeding. I know we're introducing livestock feeding. What kinds of food there are, you're gonna see pellets, flakes, frozen, nori, so on and so forth. What I do in my tank is uh, my two clownfish. Um, I feed, feed them sustainable aquatics. Um, pellets, 0.5 millimeters. I had a one millimeter at first, but it was too big, they couldn't eat it. And I actually use a feeding ring, and it's just a little piece of plastic that floats in your tank. And what's awesome about that is I put the food inside the feeding ring, and then it doesn't go all over the tank and get sucked into the overflow. So it only feeds them, and I don't get a lot of extra waste there. Um, when you're feeding, just make sure you have the right kind of food for your coral, for your anemone, for your fish. Vary it, you know, um, if you wanna uh, if you have a finicky eater, you know, you might have to soak it in garlic. Um, they, they like the taste of that. Some people soak it in vitamins, but a lot of your food already has vitamins and nobody knows if that really helps anyways. Um, my guys, what I feed my tank, besides the pellet foods, um, I feed small pieces of shrimp to my anemone and to my pistol shrimp. I also feed larger pellets to the pistol shrimp. Um, I feed um, a version of uh, BRS, uh, Mr. Chili's Reef Food to my corals, and I also feed mice shrimp as a treat. A um, couple other things to consider when you're feeding is how to properly thaw the food. If you get a, a frozen pellet, you definitely don't just want to throw the pellet in there, right? Um, you want to thaw the pellet and then remove all of that extra water. Um, I can talk about how to do that in more depth, but just know there are really good ways to thaw the food. And then an automatic feeding system. I have one. I only use it when I go away. The thing about automatic feeding systems is, um, you know, they they usually do put out quite a bit of food, and they usually stay on top. So you would need to buy the correct kind of pellet that some of it's going to stay on top, and some of it's going to sink down for your other animals. Anyway, sorry that's a, again a long video. Hopefully, for those of you who are new to the hobby, um, you have a lot of ideas now uh, and some things to think about when you're going forward in this hobby. Again, like, check out my website, ask any questions. Um, I'm always here to help. Uh, I love this hobby, and I hope you fall in love with it too. Thanks a lot, everybody.